I'd like to introduce our friend, uh, Drago Plechko, known to us as Drago, yes. <laughs> who did his undergrad at either Oxford or Cambridge. I forget now. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to those guys for never getting, but did his PhD in the seminar for statistics at ETH uh, Zurich, which is a great university. His interests are implying causal inference to trust worthy uh, data science. And let me cut this short so you have time, more time to talk. Interested in epidemiologic questions of causation and intensive care unit research, so very relevant to medical and uh, AI tools in the ICU. Mm -hmm. um, let me turn it over. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's seminar. Today, I'm going to talk about causal health equity. And in particular, I'm going to talk about building uh, building, uh, building a taxonomy of causal health equity. And uh, as, as I was introduced already, I'm Drago, and I'm currently a postdoc in Columbia Computer Science. OK, so before I move on to the, to the details of the talk, I want to share some references where you can read more about this line of work and where you can see the results uh, from, from recent years on this topic. So firstly, there's a, there's a very large paper that came out a couple of weeks ago. It's called Causal Fairness Analysis. It came out in Foundations and Trends in Machine Learning. And uh, you, can see the, you can see the cover of the paper here. So this paper is, very, is a very long paper. It's 250 pages, but puts together all of the insights that we had on causal fairness analysis in the last four years. So this is like a comprehensive way to learn a lot about, about this topic. So that's, that's the first resource that I want to share. Uh, secondly, there's a bunch of tutorials now. Some of them are available online if you want to uh, learn more about this topic. So we presented this tutorial at, uh, at, uh, at the International Conference for Machine Learning, ICML, in 2022. And just a couple of weeks ago, we were also in Vancouver in the AAAI conference. So we have a recent version of the tutorial from, the, from, from a couple of weeks ago, which is four hours long. And you can, you can learn more about the details of what is discussed today. And finally, I just want to mention a series of lectures on causal fairness analysis that were lectured within, within the course on, on causal inference in Columbia Computer Science. Here we have about 10 hours of lectures in total that cover everything everything that, that we, we have done on the topic. OK, so let me begin. So first of all, I, I promised to talk about causal health equity. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I can, though. Oh, come on. No, sorry. Yeah. Cool. I don't think I can. I'm she can. Uh, OK, so first of all, I promised to talk about causal health equity, right? And what we want to do first is we want to search for a definition of, of, of causal health equity. And uh, I want to begin with, with showing you some of the definitions of, of, of health equity from some of the major organizations con uh, concerned with public health. So, for example, the World Health Organization says that equity is the absence of unfair, avoidable, or remediable differences among groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically, or by any other dimension of inequality, right? So this is the, this is the WHO definition of, of health equity. Of course, the, the CDC, they have their own definition, and it's sort of in a, in a similar spirit. It says that health equity is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest, highest level of health. OK, so this is a very similar definition to the WHO one. And finally, I just want to mention the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who are very interested in, in issues of equity. They have a slightly more elaborate definition is along similar lines, but it's slightly more specific. It does. It also states in the definition that it requires that we remove obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, powerlessness and their consequences. OK, so this is this is what what the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation says. Now, what I want to what I want to what, what I want to sort of emphasize in this talk today is that on one side, we have these definitions from, from public health organizations that tell us how to think about, about health equity. And the way that we as data scientists would like to think about the problem is very different from these inspirational quotes that we are beginning with, right? So if you think about the tools that we're using when we're doing data science and trying to analyze data, we're, we're looking at electronic health records, right? We're analyzing EHR data. This is one of the core things that we try to do as, 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 as medical data scientists. What we want to do is we want to perform hypothesis testing, right? We want to have some something that is a formal statistical hypothesis. We want to compute some p-values and we want to reject possibly some hypothesis and to say something formally about what's going on in this data, right? And finally, what is going to be a big, big emphasis in this talk as well, we also want to uh, do some effect estimation and we want to in particular use tools of causal reasoning, okay? 
for this problem at hand. And what you will note is you will note there's a huge gap between having definitions that are just written in words and between the formal language that we that we have at the bottom, right? So our task for today is to bridge the gap between inspirational quotes coming from public health institutions to formal tools that that are that are that are familiar to to mathematicians, data scientists, computer scientists. And, and so on, okay? And as I mentioned, causal inference is gonna play a prominent role. And before I delve deep into, into health equity and give you a bunch of examples and data analysis, I wanna give you a quick introduction into, into causal inference. So what is, how do we think about, what are the tools that we use? So this introduction is gonna be quick and formal. You can, you can take a whole course on causal inference at Columbia CS to learn more about this. But the basic tool, the, 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 one of the key objects that we think about is the so-called structural causal model or SCM for short. So structural causal model consists of four key things, okay? And I will list four key things now. So firstly, there's a set of endogenous or observed variables labeled V1 to Vn. So this you can think of as those variables that are recorded in the data that we have, right? So these are the ones that we see that we can, we can analyze. What we also assume, we assume there's a, there's a number of exogenous variables, which are or unobserved variables, which are going to be labeled U1 to UM. So these, these, these variables you can think of as the latent noise that adds, adds variations into the system that we're analyzing. And of course, crucially, one of the key aspects of the structural causal model is that the causal model, structural causal model contains information about how specific variables in the system attain their values, right? So in particular, a very important aspect of this is when, when a variable VI determines its value in the real world, what are the other variables in the system that are possibly influencing the variable VI? Okay, all of this information and the specific function itself of how the how the variable attains its value is contained in the structural causal model. Okay, so this is a very important element of the structural causal model. And finally, what we have as well, we have a distribution over the set of the exogenous variables. So over the exogenous variables, we have a distribution. This is the distribution of the noise. Okay, and the, the good way to think about this U and with little U, I'm abbreviating, abbreviating a specific instance of the noise variable. You can think about this as different individuals in your in your population, right? This is the this is the good way to to think about this. So what is crucial is that if we have if we have a structural causal model. Uh, what we can do is we can solve all kinds of inference tasks, right? So tasks that are related to causal reasoning, if we have access to this true model of the underlying reality, we can so answer all kinds of questions about discrimination, about treatment effects, and so on. The difficulty, of course, comes from the, I'll, I'll give you here a running example uh, of, of an SCM. So let's say that this is the underlying reality. So the observed variables in this case are X, Z, W, and Y. I have unobserved variables U, X, U, Z, and you and these are the these are the functions that, that determine the values of the of these observed variables. Okay. So what is important is that in in reality, and especially when you have humans involved, we almost never have access to these functions of the key, right? We never know what these functions are. This is sort of this is the underlying reality that we do not have access to, right? But at the same time, what we want to do is we still want to perform perform some kind of causal reasoning. And what we're going to do is we're going to use some assumptions that are going to be encoded in a weaker form. And the, what we're going to do is we're going to derive a so-called causal diagram from the structural causal model. Okay, and uh, what what is this, uh, what is a causal diagram appearing here is G in the bottom. So a causal diagram is a directed acyclic graph, a DAG, which has the following. So it has a node VI for each observed variable. So every variable that is observed in the data becomes a node in the graph. Uh, if you go back to our example, we have X, Z, W, Y, we just put them down as nodes. Then we say there's an edge from VI to VJ. If VI listens, sorry, if VJ listens to VI when it when it attains its value, right? If VI is a functional argument to the mechanism to the mechanism of VJ. So going back to our example, we see we see here the W takes X and Z as input. So that means we're going to draw arrows from X and Z to W, and Y takes Z as an input. So we have a Z to Y. Finally, what is also important, there could be bidirected edges. In the in the in this directory, graph, 
And what that means is this is sort of trying to represent latent or hidden confounding that may be present in the data. Okay, so the bidirected edge signifies that the noise variables between two, between two observed variables, the noise may be correlated or may share information, right? If you go back to ESCM, here double mean line, they, they both listen to, to the unobserved variable U. So what that means is I have to add a bidirected edge between W and Y. Okay, so this is the process of how to how to how to construct the, the causal diagram from the from the structural causal model. Now we have we have introduced the two key building blocks, the SCM and the causal diagram. What what we now want to say is we want to say a bit about how this how these notions will be useful when thinking about issues of, of health equity. And to begin with, I want to talk about notions of, of a counterfactual. I'm going to first give you the definition of what is called the potential outcome. And I'm going to explain you how you can think about potential outcomes. So potential outcome, I'm going to read out the definition, which may be confusing at first, but we will unpack after this. So the potential outcome of y to an action to x equals x, denoted by y, and I, I use subscript x here, uh, is the value of y for a specific unit u. As, as we said, a specific unit is just an individual in the data in the model x, m sub x, which we call the sub model, where the equations of x are replaced with x. Okay, so this is uh, for someone seeing this for the first time, it's not a super simple sentence to understand. So let's see what happens. So we have our structural causal model that has the, the, the ground truth, it's the, it's the true mechanisms that are out there in reality. What we do first, we, we intervene, we change something in the system, and in particular, the equation for x is replaced by a fixed value of x. Okay, this corresponds to some kind of intervention in the in the real world, possibly. And finally, the way to get the potential outcome is we just plug in the, 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 the noise variables u into this set of equations and we get the solution that we label y sub x of u. Okay, so this is the definition of a, of a potential outcome. Now, what is important, the potential outcome or potential response is also sometimes called a counterfactual, right? And a counterfactual in the settings is, what, to say this in words, in, in something that is understandable and compatible with human reasoning, you can think about the value that y would have obtained had x been equal to x for a specific individual u equals u. Okay, this is, the, this is what, what is important. Now, oops, okay. Uh, now what I want to say is the following. Okay, so this is the notion of a, of a, of a counterfactual. What I want to say next is that, of course, at the end of the day, we, 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 are, we want to work with probabilities, right? We want to make statistical statements. We want to make data science statements. What we need to do is we need to connect notions of counterfactuals with statements on, on, on probabilities, right? And I'm just going to give you in this slide, I'm going to tell you how this is done formally. This is, of course, this is, this is becoming technical, but it's just sort of more for completeness and for those who want to learn more about this uh, and going forward. So first of all, uh, let's see how we can we can reason about probabilities when it comes to when it comes to counterfactuals. So suppose now that we have a specific SCM that is known to us, and suppose that we have a number of of, of, of different counterfactuals. So I have the first counterfactual y sub x being equal to y. So this this set of variables y is responding to an intervention that sets x to little x, and I'm wondering, and I'm interested when this is equal to a fixed value little y. And there's a number of things in between, and there's a final outcome which Z responds to an intervention W equals little W and Z equals little Z. Again, a fixed value. Okay. So now the question is: if I have this event, right, what is the probability? How do I compute the probability mass associated with this event? Right. The way that this is done is the following. So basically, we we go over all the units of the population, so all of the individuals in the population. What we look at, we look at the potential outcome. Y, y sub x, and we check whether for this unit, this potential outcome gets exactly this uh, sub little, little y value, right? Is it compatible with, with this first event? And then we do the same process until the end, right? We want to see whether this unit is compatible with this potential outcome z sub w being equal to little z. And what we do in the end, we just add up all the probability, right? So all of the, the probability mass associated for each of the units that is compatible with these potential outcomes is added up, right? So this, in this way, the SCM into, introduces some kind of a probability distribution over the counterfactuals. And importantly for us as well, is that when these subscripts are empty, so I'm not hypothesizing about any interventions, we get the so-called observational distribution, right? And what we're going to work with today is we're going to work a lot with the observational distribution, right? So in this setting, we can drop all the subscripts and we can put everything together 
into the into single x and y. And basically, there's a great simplification of this expression when we have the observational when we have the observational distribution. So don't for, for those of you who are not familiar with this, you don't need to understand the the exact detail of, of what's going on here. But for completeness, for someone who tries to wants to dig deeper, this is the direction you you may want to explore. Right? Um, okay, good. So this is the this is the quick crash course into causal inference. Uh, after this, I want to start connecting and start uh, going going towards questions of, of health equity, right? And I'm going to begin with uh, with a specific example. And this this is this is actually this is this is based on real data from the from the Boston Hospital, the Mimic Four data set you may be familiar with. So what we do is, and a lot of investigations of health equity begin in a similar fashion. So what happens first is there's an observed disparity between groups. In this instance, we're interested in mortality rates after ICU admission. And what we want to look at is we want to look at differences between white and African-American populations. Okay? And what we observe in this data is we actually observe that the death rate is 0.8% higher for the white population than it is for the African-American population. And if you're thinking about this very naively, you may think, does this mean that white population, that white people Terminated is of course doesn't right. Everyone knows this is hundred percent not the case. Immediately signals to you that this just this looking at just population averages is not a good way to to quantify and understand what is going on. So what we're going to do is what we're going to use the tools of causal reasoning to sort of get a better understanding of how this disparity is generated. That we observe in the data, right? So I'm going to build the, the model. This is a causal diagram, and I'm going to explain what is contained in the diagram, right? So first, X is going to be race. This is the so-called protector or sensitive attribute. This is the characteristic that we care about. We have illness, illness and treatment information W. This is the set of mediators that is uh, that are lying possibly in a causal path from X to Y, right? We have a set of confounders that could be associated with race such as location, for example, or age. So these are things that are not necessarily causally influenced by the protected attribute, but could be related. So this is why we have a bidirected edge here between X and Z, the set of confounders. And finally, the final variable of interest is the is that, right? This is the outcome that we're that we're looking at, right? So this is our this is our causal model of, of this situation. And now what we can understand based on the model is there are three fundamentally different ways that this disparity could be generated, right? And let's go over them in order. The first one is the so-called direct effect from X to Y. So it could be the case that the outcome is influenced directly by race, right? It's just the X to Y uh, arrow. Then it could be the case that the outcome is a consequence of illness severity, which we know it is, but maybe illness severity is affected to race, affected by race, right? So this is the so-called indirect pathway that is going through W, from X to W to Y. Finally, it could also be the case that age or demographics that are correlated maybe with race are affecting the outcome, right? And what is important is that when we look at when we look at uh, these three different things, what you can see is that this measure here that we're going to call the TV measure, the total variation measure, this measure puts all the, all of these types of variations together, right? So the direct, indirect, and spurious effects are all grouped together in a single measure, right? And what, what immediately, for us, is an immediate cause for concern because these different types of discrimination are fundamentally different or sort of different ways of generating the disparity are fundamentally different, right? Based on the setting on the setting that you're ready, okay? And the question for us is how do we disentangle these, these variations within the total variation measure, right? So th this measure is also known as the parity gap and it's related to the notions of demographic or statistical parity. Okay, so before I move on, I just want to say that this 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 graphical model that I have here, I'm going to use this for the rest of the talk. So this type of structure that we see in the data, the protected attribute, a set of meters, an outcome, and a set of confounders, this structure actually repeats over a lot of different applications that we're going to see today. So we're going to assume we're going to use this as a template graphical model for our explorations today. And we're going to call this the standard fairness model, or short SFM. So we're going to use the standard fairness model for, uh, for, for trying to understand some of these questions of, of health equity. So what I want to do next is now I now I mentioned these direct, indirect, and spurious effects. The question is how do we how do we conceptualize these effects and how can we measure them and how can we perform thought experiments or in German Gedanken Experimente that allow us to to quantify to quantify uh, these effects that are direct, indirect, or spurious. So I'm going to start with this thought experiment. I'm going to read it out. 
So for the first question that we ask is, for minority group individuals that are correspond to x equal to zero, how would their mortality change had they been white while keeping the age, comorbidities, illness, severity, and treatment unchanged at the level x equals x zero, okay? So this is the thought experiment that I have in mind, written in, in the notation of potential outcomes, and I'm here highlighting in red versus blue what it, where the differences lie. So here, let me actually do the graphical contrast immediately to see what's going on. So along the in, the in the left side, along the direct path, we have x equals to x1. So if you go to this, if you go to our standard fairness model, along the direct path, y listens to, to x equals x1, whereas along the indirect path, w listens to x0, right? This is what this potential outcome is trying to, trying to denote. We're comparing this against the setting in which uh, x equals to x0 along the direct arrow and the indirect arrow, right? So when you compare these two things graphically, the variations that we're getting are exactly coming from this difference, right? It's exactly the variations that are transmitted along the direct effect, okay? So this gives us a way of quantifying the, the, the direct effect. And what is, what is nice is we have like an expression, right? We have an expression, we have a potential outcome, we have a quantity that we can compute to, to quantify the direct effect. Okay, so that's step one. Of course, we have to do a similar thing for the indirect and the spurious effect. So let's look at what we would do for the indirect effect. So we were saying for minority group individuals, x equals to x zero, how would their mortality change had their illness, severity, and treatment been, been at the level of a white person while keeping the age, comorbidities, and race unchanged? Okay, so the way to write this down, I'm gonna call this the counterfactual indirect effect, is again, difference between some potential outcomes and I'm, I will give you the graphical representation from which you can immediately see what's going on. In the left side, x equals x0 along the direct path, but we have x1 along the indirect path. In the right-hand side, we have x0 along all of the pathways. When we take the difference between left and the right side here, the variations that are induced by this are coming exactly from the indirect pathway, right? So what we have is we have a motion here in this difference that tells us something about, quantifies the indirect effect in the data. Okay, so this is the complement. The first part is about the direct effect. The second part is about the indirect effect. What we said as well, there's one part that is missing is the spurious effect, right? So how can we quantify the spurious effect? And again, we're playing a similar game here. We, we're performing an outflow experiment. So for a minority group individuals, x equals x0, and white individuals, x equals x1, how would their mortality differ had they both been set to the minority group by intervention? Okay, so let's try to write this sentence as a difference between potential outcomes. What we have now is along the, along the causal pathways, we have x equal to x zero, but we're conditioning on, on different events, okay? So this is the, this is the final part of the puzzle, is that along, along the indirect and the direct path, we always have x equal to x zero. But what is important now in the left side, this z, the set of confounders z, is aware of the fact that x equals x1. So we're conditioning on x equals x1 on the left side, whereas in the right, we're conditioning on x equals x0. What, we, what happens then, is when we take the difference between these things, we get exactly, uh, we get exactly the, the quantification of the spurious effects, okay? Good, so that's the, those are the three thought experiments, and these are the three formal expressions that we have that allow us to quantify these different types of discrimination. This is the first step. Now, what we started off with, if you recall, we started off with a TV measure, right? With a total variation measure. And you may be asking, well, I have these ways of quantifying. Are these three ways of quantifying discrimination fundamentally different from the TV measure? And are they related to the TV measure in some sense? Which is our next result, which is in our paper. And I have some pointers to the, to the big paper, to, to some of the formal theorems. Well, this one is theorem 4.3, which is a, a, a TV decomposition. So what we can do, is we can look at the at the TV measure, so it's given here as a graphical contrast, right? So we begin with this. So here in the top left, we have x equal to x1 along all of the pathways. In the bottom right, we have x equal to x0 along all of the pathways, right? So this is just the marginal difference between groups, right? When we take the difference of these two things, we have the, the we get the TV measure, right? Which, which is what we started from. What we do then is we play this addition and subtraction game. So I'm gonna subtract from the top from the to, uh, top left. I'm gonna subtract the specific potential outcome, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of, sort of subtract and then add it back again, of course. And what we what we observe in the first part is we added this outcome in which x equals to x one along the direct and the indirect path. Right, and what we observe is that the first this the first difference in the row in the first row corresponds to corresponds to some notion of the spurious effect. Okay, that's good. So in the next row we have we have this 
out from the we subtracted, and we're adding this outcome again. Okay, and we're playing the same game again. So we're subtracting a new potential outcome in which x equals to x1 along the direct path, but along spurious and indirect paths, x equals to x0. Okay, and what is important to observe when we look at the difference between this outcome and this outcome, we get some quantification of the indirect effect. And now what we need to do at the end is we need to add this back, right, into the mix. And what is what is super nice about this result is when you add back what is what is sort of subtracted there in the final goal when we compare these two potential outcomes, we get exactly the direct effect, right? And what that means is we started off with a TV measure and we have now disentangled these different variations within the TV measure, right? Which is something that is super useful. Written formally, the TV measure can be decomposed into its constituent parts, which correspond to the direct, indirect, and spurious effects, right? So this is the this is the this is one of the key building blocks in the in, a, in the theory moving forward. Okay, so this is the TV decomposition. So within the par within the parity gap measure, the TV measure, there are essentially different types of variations that we can formally disentangle mathematically. This is a useful result. So I want I want to dive a bit deeper into this. I want to say a bit more about the structure of some of these measures. So this is now uh, some of the some of the technical results that I find are quite exciting. So it turns out to be the case that these potential outcomes, these differences, for example, the counterfactual direct effect. Uh, can be written out in a very specific way. So basically, the, 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 the difference here, that is the counterfactual direct effect, can be written as, as a, it can be factorized. Actually, the, the indirect effect can be factorized in a very similar way. So let me, let me talk about them together. So basically, what we have first is we, we compare potential outcomes between individuals, okay? So we compare the potential outcome where y responds to x1, along the direct path and w responds to x0 along the indirect path versus y responding to x0, right? And we're comparing this at the individual level, right? So all of the noise variables u here are fixed in some sense, okay? So these are the comparisons that we're getting. And we can make this a comparison for each unit of the population, okay? So this is the first part, is the, is the unit level difference, right? This is the factorization of the measures. The second part is to do with, uh, with the posterior distribution that is assigned to each unit. So let's zoom in into the posterior distribution P of U given X zero. So what is P of U given X zero? It is the probability mass assigned to this specific individual times the, the indicator that the individual belongs to the minority group divided by the overall probability mass of this, of this group, right? So it's just the relative importance of a specific individual in this in this in this group. And what is what is important is that this factorization allows us to allows us to 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 make many observations. So there are two parts, right? The first part selects the mechanism that we're trying to understand, which is either direct or indirect. And the second part selects the group of units that we're trying to analyze. Okay. And importantly, these two things are selected almost independently, right? So we're talking about the mechanism and the units almost independently. And very nicely, the question is now that you see there's a posterior P of U given X zero, which means we're quantifying discrimination for the minority group. Could it be the case there are other different interesting posterior distributions that we could look at? For example, could we quantify direct indirect effects for, the, for different age groups? Could we quantify different uh, direct and indirect effects for different illness severity groups? Could we do something else as well, right? Et cetera. So we, we have a lot of possible options. Yes. Yes, please. So this idea of intersectionality. Yes. Like, uh, you know, race and gender confound. Yes. Um, so you're saying here, am I understanding this, is this right? That you're saying you could, you could look at like say race and then kind of stratify those. Is, this is exactly yes. These different things. Mm -hmm. um, is that is that the um, is that the way to get at intersectionality questions or? Yes. Or and why not do it as just like you know, or like just one new group that's like gender plus race. Both are, I think both are valid options, actually. I'm happy to, to debate online. Would you can, offline, sorry, but I think what you can do is you can sort of look at effect of race and then stratify by different groups, but you can sort of take like a tensor product of, of these two things and, and look at that as well. So I'm happy to, I'm, I'm focusing today more on the binary case, but we have a lot of results for the, for these. No, 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 no. Fundamentally, I don't think there's a conceptual leap in, in, in that, to be honest. But a great question, great question. Uh, good. 
So this was this these were the factorizations for the direct and the indirect effects. What is important is we also want to show the factorization for the spurious effect. And what you will see here, the factorization is actually different. So here we have differences between outcomes at the at the unit level. Here we have a unit level outcome y sub x zero that is multiplied by a posterior difference. And this is very interesting because it shows a completely different factorization from the from the from the direct and indirect effects. And I think that this is one of the reasons why the spurious variations have been largely ignored in the causal inference literature. So this part on spurious variations has been missing for from 20, 30 years of literature on mediation. People have not got to, to the to the spurious part until only very recently. And the reason is this is a fundamentally different type of quantity. Okay, so these two types of variations, causal, and by causal I mean direct, indirect, and spurious are, are very, very different. And of course, when we see this factorization, the question that we ask is, can we pick other posterior differences? Are there other ways to, to conceptualize spurious effects as well? And motivated by this, I want to give you some intuition about what our possibilities are, and I want to give you the intuition for, for, for one of the key results that, I, that we call the fairness map. And it's, it's the following. So what we can do is we can think about the whole population of the United States, right? And we can try to qu quantify direct, indirect, and spurious effects for the whole population of the United States, right? Then we may go into a specific subset of this population, and we may try to quantify direct, indirect, and spurious effects only for the women in the United States, right? And importantly, the first and the second quantifications may be different, right? Maybe the bias when you focus just on the women is different than in the overall population, okay? Of course, we can we can zoom in even more, right? So we may consider women in the United States that are below 40 years of age, right? So this is, an, again, a specific subgroup that may be of interest, and we can try to quantify the discrimination in this specific subgroup. We can go even further, right? And we can quantify the discrimination for women below 40 that have a specific illness severity score of 0. 0.7. And here I'm just thinking of illness severity is between, between zero and one. So maybe I can fix the illness severity and again, try to quantify direct and direct and spurious effects, right? And finally, I can even condition on the outcome itself, right? So I can think about, for example, uh, quantifying direct and indirect effects for women below 40 with an illness severity 0. 0.7 who survived their ICU stay, for example. There's also a possibility. Have these uh, did these people experience discrimination, right? So what what this shows is it shows us there are different ways, different levels of granularity in which which we can work, right? When we're quantifying discrimination, the final thing that we can do for a specific individual, Catherine, who who is uh, who is below forty, has an Ill illness severity. 0.7 who did survive, we can even conceptualize what it would mean to quantify the discrimination for this person. Of course, statistically, this will be very hard. Okay. This is the point where we have a single individual, it will be very hard to for this to be tractable, right? What I'm going to call, I'm going to call this the population axis because it sort of allows us to pick different levels of granularity when we're quantifying discrimination. And the second part I'm going to call the, the mechanism axis because it tells me which mechanism. This is not explicit in this slide, but it will be in the next, which mechanism I'm interested in between direct and direct experience okay and now i want to put this put this result in a formal way which of course uh, to to get all the nuances and the technical detail you probably have to open the paper but i want to give you an intuition about what's going on i'm going to use exactly the same axis that i described so first i'm going to i'm going to use the population axis <laughs> then i'm going to add the mechanism axis and I'm gonna I, I have direct and direct spurious mechanisms here. I also have added the causal effect as well. So causal in this setting means the, the putting direct and indirect effects together, right? This is what I mean by causal. Okay. And now what is important is we start off with a TV measure in the top, and we're now decomposing the TV measure into, into its constituent parts. So first of all, we can do the decomposition at the at the, at the population level, which gives us different quantities. Uh, that are used, right? These are specific quantities that are used to quantify discrimination at this level, right? The population level, then we do this at the X specific level, we have specific quantities for direct and direct and spurious effect. We then move to the X Z specific level. Now, what is what is sort of a side note in the standard fairness model, there's no quantification of spurious once we condition on all of the confounders, but this, this is not a, I think, a key point of emphasis. What is important is that we can also condition on all the observed variables, right? And have a 
have a notion of, 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 of discrimination, and finally, all the way to the unit level, right? So these are the quantities. And what I wanna do now is I wanna, I wanna sort of, for those familiar with causal inference, I wanna emphasize how nice this theoretical umbrella is. So let's begin, right? So first of all, the first thing in the top left that appears is the average treatment effect, the ATE. So this is probably the most commonly considered quantity in causal inference that goes back to, to, works, to the works of Ronald Fisher in the 1920s, right? So this is an extremely commonly considered quantity. What we have in the layer below is we have the so-called effect of treatment on the treated. So this, this quantity goes, to the, goes back to the, to the work in econometrics in the, in the 1980s and the 1990s. It quantifies the causal effect within a specific uh, stratum of the, of the treatment. When we go beyond this, we, when we talk about the Z-specific total effects, the, these quantities are of prime importance for people who are studying heterogeneous treatment effects. So there's another thing that is very important, right? So there's another really well-known quantity that is appearing in this, in this map. Going beyond this, if we look at the V-specific total effects, these are known as, as the probabilities of causation. This goes back to the work of Judea Pearl in 2000. And, in 2000. So basically, these are the so-called probability of necessity and sufficiency. They have very powerful, important implications in philosophy and law and so on. And finally, for those more familiar with the modern literature, we also have the UTE, the, the, the unit level a total effect, which is the which is the uh, famous criterion, the popular criterion in the in the fair machine learning literature, which is called counterfactual fairness, right? So what our map has, it is it is sort of systematically organized all of these things that exist in the literature, and beyond this, we have even more. So here we have the natural direct and natural indirect effects. These are the two most popular and most widely used quantities for mediation analysis. This is the world work of Pearl from 2000, right? We also have the X specific and uh, direct and indirect effects, which are the thought experiments that we described just before. And what you can see is there's a bunch of other other interesting measures in this in this map. So what this gives, it gives a sort of a, a coherent theoretical umbrella that organizes a lot of the developments in the in the in the history of of, of causal inference, which is which is I think a, a great a great point for us and something that makes us as causal analysts very happy. I think. Uh, good. Okay. So I've given you I've given you everything on the on the theory side. Let me. Uh, let me move to 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 health equity and let's see how how this stuff and how this intersects with health equity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a catalog of different settings of of health equity. I'm going to distinguish different tasks. I'm going to give you examples that ground these different tasks. So the first task that I'm going to talk about is the task. I'm going to call it task one. Is the task of bias detection. So what I have is just have I just have the standard fairness model that I had before, and importantly, I have a single outcome Y that I'm interested in. Right. So no AI tools involved. This is just observing the outside reality. Examples to think about. Maybe we're trying to analyze mortality. For example, all cause mortality, hospital mortality, mortality after ICU admission, anything like this. We could be analyzing the disease incidence, for example. Are there disparities, racial disparities in the incidence of COVID-19 and the incidence of, of, of other diseases and so on, right? This is another example. The third one could be healthcare access. Is there a differential effect of race on, on access to healthcare, right? So all of these tasks fall, uh, sorry, all of these examples fall under the task of bias detection, task one. So that's the first foundational task that we have, but there are more involved settings that, are, that, become, that become, become more involved, right? So I also want to mention the task, talk about the task of fair prediction, which I call task two. What is happening now is there's a specific predictor Y hat that is being added to the system. And we are now in charge of constructing this predictor. And very importantly, and this is, I think, completely underappreciated in the literature, is that these two settings we can immediately see are very different. Right? And we need to use different, that we need something beyond this setting to address this setting, right? Uh, of course, so we have an outcome line, and predictor I have, as I said. So what, 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 is, what are examples of this are illness severity scores. So for example, or, or mental health assessments, right? Think about Hamilton depression rating scales. So it's a, it's a scale that is, that is assessed by, by a clinician, and perhaps we want to build an automated tool that based on our electronic health records tries to predict this uh, this rating for, 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 for a set of patients, right? So these are the types of settings, right? Trying to replicate some human labels, right? This is what is going on in task two. Finally, triage tools in, in emergency rooms when clinicians score the acuity of the patients, I think one to five usually in the US, 
So basically, this is another outcome that we could try to predict from electronic health records. So we have a human label, and we're trying to predict this. What is important, we want to talk about how do we conceptualize equity? How do we conceptualize equity in, in such settings? And the third uh, very, very interesting task, also related to clinical practice quite closely, is the setting in which we have an outcome Y of interest, and we have a specific decision D that precedes the outcome, and the decision is used to optimize this outcome. And any kind of, I think, many, many, if not all clinical scenarios fall under, under, this, under this umbrella. And I will give some, you some, some very well-known examples. So, so clinicians may be interested in optimizing survival by, by giving people heart transplants or deliver transplants or something like this. So heart transplant is my decision D and survival is my outcome. Uh, it could be the case that we want to optimize survival by give, giving people cancer treatment, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and so on, right? This is another example. One that I'm gonna talk about today is optimizing respiratory stability using a ventilator in the ICU. So if, if you have respiratory problems in the ICU, the clinician may put you on mechanical ventilation. Yes. So are you saying that is different from say test one because there might be a bias in Y that then represents a decision yes. and bias for decision. This, this is exactly the direction. This is exactly, I, I will be walking along those lines very shortly. Uh, okay, so this is the overview, right? This is our big picture, task one, task two, and task three. And importantly, we're going to develop different tools for, for these tasks. So what I want to go, I want to go back. And now that I've developed all these tools, let me give you a solution of, of, a, of a specific applied problem, right? So we had this disparity in mortality after ICU admission between white and African-American populations. And we were asking the question, do similar mortality rates or equal mortality rates, do they say anything about, about, about equity, right? And we, we build this, we'll build this graphical model, right? And what we want to do is we want to perform a causal explanation, right? So we want to perform a causal explanation based on the thought experiments that were described. And it could be that there's a direct effect. So it could be that minority patients are more or less likely to die when we keep all the other variables equal. This is one explanation. There could be an indirect effect, which means that minority patients may have a lower or higher illness severity and therefore may have worse or better outcomes. And it could be also that there's a spurious explanation that minority patients are younger or older on average, for example, which could also explain a difference in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the mortality rates, okay? And uh, this is, our task is to, to disambiguate between these three things. And importantly, in terms of equity principles that, that we are trying to, trying to look at here, if there is a non-zero effect, direct, indirect, and spurious, we need to go deeper and we need to understand why there is a non-zero effect and whether this effect implies some kind of inequity, okay? And let's apply this to, let's apply this to, to the MIMIC-4 data set, and I will unpack the plot now, but fascinatingly, in this disparity of 0.8%, so this is the total variation measure, so the difference is 0.8% between groups, there are three different things qualitatively going on, at least three different things going on at the same time. So first of all, what, what I will highlight is there's a confounded effect that favors the, the African-American population, okay? So for some reason, along the spurious pathway, African-American patients have better outcomes, okay? This is the first thing we observe. We will zoom in into why that is. What you will observe as well is that the direct effect is also non-zero, but it favors the African-American again. So what that means is that when you keep everything else the same, if you're an African-American, you have a higher chance of surviving ICU. And I've worked with, for the last couple of years, I've worked with one of the top ICU clinicians in the world, and he does not know how to explain this effect. So this is, this is very, very interesting because we don't know what is in the data. Because if, if you thought, think about socioeconomic status or something else, it would be exactly the opposite that we would be seeing. So we don't know, we have no clue. But what I want to do now is I want to zoom into the, into the confounded effect and give you an explanation of why there is a difference. So this is the age distribution between African-Americans and white people admitted to this ICU. So what you see, you see a, a clear shift between these two distributions, which means that African-American patients are admitted on average 10 years younger. And importantly, in the indirect effect, which, which favors the white group, what we can see as well is that even though these people are admitted 10 years younger on average, they have worse chronic health. They have more comorbidities when they come to the hospital, and they're more likely to be admitted for an emergency for an emergency condition as opposed to an elective surgery, which in turn causes, causes worse outcomes. So in some sense, what this implies, this, this inequity that we're seeing is partly due to the fact that at 50 years of age, 
African Americans in this region are have worse chronic health than white people that are sixty. So this is this is this is this is once again uh, finding this important effect, right? This important difference, and it gives you sort of a flavor of why these causal tools can be so useful. Is because we can start disambiguating between these qualitatively different things that are going on in the data. Right. And now when I present this to my, my, my colleagues who are clinicians, they ask me whether this finding is robust. Okay. And here, this is a very recent development, I think mind blowing actually, uh, from, from what my colleagues tell me is let's go to a completely different reality. Let's go to Australia and New Zealand. And there, of course, there are no African American population. There's no African American population there. But what, what they, what the minority population there is the indigenous population of, of of Australia and New Zealand. And let's do the decomposition for the indig indigenous population. What you observe is that the total variation now has a different sign, but the causal effects are almost identical. The signs of the effects, the 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 the, the signs of the effect is slightly different, but the, but the signs of the effects are identical. We are again seeing a confounded, confounded variation that favors the indigenous population in terms of survival. We are seeing a, a, a non-zero direct effect that we cannot explain, and we're seeing a large indirect effect. And if you look at the age distribution in this data, and this data is, by the way, 2 million people. So in Australia, every ICU admission that takes place is recorded in the data. So this is very large scale epidemiological data. You see exactly the same pattern of admissions. So you see people being, indigenous people being admitted younger with worse chronic health and more likely to be admitted because of, a, because of an emergency condition. Okay, so this this shows you that when you do the when you do the causal analysis, we see things that are very robust in very 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 different settings. Okay, so this is the this is why causal tools are used for 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 task one of 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 bias detection. Okay, so what I have to do next, or that I want to tell you about next, is the task of fair prediction. Okay, so in fair prediction, we have the following we have the following setting that was mentioned already. So we have the, the original or original real world. And now when doing ML prediction, we are we are adding we are adding a new mechanism, right? We are adding a Y hat and we're possibly replicating an outcome, right? And typically in machine learning, the optimal, the optimal predictor that we want to use is the P of Y given X is set and double, right? It's just a conditional distribution of Y given uh, given given everything else. This is the, the L2. If you're minimizing the L2, the squared loss, this is the this is the optimal solution. The question that we ask is that does this carry over bias from the from the true F of Y mechanism? Okay. And uh, let's think about this from sort of a, even a non-science perspective. So we know that we have in our real world at time t, we know that we have all kinds of different biases, right? Our, our, our world currently as it is, there are all kinds of differences between populations. We, are, we have a lot of biases. If we collect data from this reality, the data set that we have is gonna contain this bias as an imprint, okay? And if we feed this data to a machine learning system that is going to be used in the future, what we're going to be doing, we may easily be propagating. It will not be a surprise that we're sort of learning a bias from the existing data, right? Which means that at time t, we may have a bias for the dead. What would be what would be better and what we want to go towards is we want to have a more fair world at the time step t plus one, right? And just to reiterate this point, and I, I, will, I will not go into the detail, but just think about having a little linear system, right? Where your y is a linear function of, of x and w. You have the attribute, you have the mediator, just a linear function. If you collect data from this linear system, and if you just do order these squares and you replace the y with the y hat, the optimal solution is just going to recover the exact linear coefficients in the in the f of y mechanism, right? What this shows is that if we just train without any any other considerations, we will we will have we will have exactly the same problem moving into the future, right? So in some sense, we will be propagating bias. This is the first realization, and I think going back uh, importantly for those interested in calibration, this is the reason why calibration and multi calibration are not uh, not not good tools uh, in our in my view for 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 solving this task fully. Okay, so now now that we know that this property is biased, the question is how do we do this, right? Once we have this realization, what what could we do? And importantly, one of the key ideas in the literature is to minimize the TV measure. So a lot of the literature focuses on minimizing the marginal disparity between groups, right? So let's just find a predictor that has uh, the same marginal rates, right? Of uh, of the of the prediction, and here there's a very important there's a very important result. I would love to have more more time to go into the technical nitty gritty of this result, but I will have to just sketch out what the result is saying. So think about having having a linear structural causal model. 
that is compatible with, uh, with, the, with the standard fairness model, right? So we have some linear system that is trying to represent our underlying reality. And as I said, we have the causal diagram and just the SFN with the predictor y hat added to it. Okay. So now imagine that all of these coefficients and these, these A coefficients here are matrices that tell us what are the linear coefficients between different variables in the system. Just imagine now that these coefficients are sampled uniformly in the minus one, one interval independently. So what this gives me, it gives me a way to sample, sample at random from the space of some, some linear structural causal models, right? So I have a, I, when I sample this, I get an SEM at random every time when I do this uniform sampling. What is interesting is that if we try to do exactly as the literature prescribes, if we try to find the, for this, for a specific SCM, say we sample M5 here, if for this specific SCM, we try to find the optimal predictor, uh, an optimal linear predictor that satisfies the TV measure, the following, we're asking the following question basically. So we have the TV, as we saw, as the decomposition, the direct, indirect, and spurious effects. But what is important is that we know that when we solve this problem, because this is a constraint that the TV measure, the marginal gap is going to be zero, is going to be, we're going to have TV equal to zero, right? The question that we ask is, is the direct effect going to be zero? Is the indirect effect going to be zero? Or is the spurious effect going to be zero when we look at the TV optimal solution? Importantly, uh, the question is, how often does this happen when we sample these SEMs at random? And here comes the super surprising result. Statement number one, the probability that T equals zero implies that all of the effects are zero is zero. It never happens. So th this is like a, this is a measure zero set in a Lebesgue sense, right? This never happens, right? So on, on average, when you minimize the TV, the causal effects will not be zero. This is a huge cause for concern, right? Because we know there's an interpretation behind these causal effects. Another even stronger statement says that at least one of the, the, the effects is going to be bounded away from zero with some, with some, with some probability one half. So we can even make a stronger result. It's almost guaranteed or very likely that things could go wrong if you, if you optimize in this way, right? So this is the key takeaway of, 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 this, of this result, right? So if we focus just on this statistical difference, just the marginal difference between groups, the predictions that we're generating may not be meaningful in terms of, in terms of their causal properties. And this, is, this has huge implications if we are using this prediction and implementing it in the real world, right? We are creating something that, is something that might, be, uh, might be undesirable in this, okay? So things could go wrong, right? So we cannot just minimize the, the TV measure. I will put here just for completeness, this is what the formal result looks like. There's a lot of details, the proof, the proof is quite involved, but I will, I will not get into the technical detail. I have to tell you about task three as well. But before I go to task three, I wanna give you an example of, of, of something like this that I mentioned already. This comes from a colleague, from, from a friend from Denmark, who has looked at this. So it turns out there's a bias when you look at Hamilton pressure rating scale. If you look at the averages, there's a different difference between men and women, right? So the question is, does training on human labels carry over bias, right? What we're trying to answer. And importantly, we build again our causal model for this. And two things to note. First, we can perform the causal explanation on the true outcome itself. So what that means is we want to look at the difference between groups and the true outcome and, contribute, and attribute direct, indirect, and spurious effects. This is part one. Part two is we can decompose the, the white hat. We can decompose our predictor as well, right? And our predictor is different from the true outcome, right? And we could get a different decomposition for the for the predictor. Okay. And now the key question is: how do we how do we think about these two decompositions, right? How do we relate them? How do we move forward to, to a better reality? And here I'm going to give you a prescription. So how to build AI predictor? This is this is a this is the causal approach. And this I think we 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 would call causal predictive parity of causal calibration in some sense. Uh, so we have a real world time t. We have some some summarization of the discrimination. Maybe direct effect equals to eight to one, uh, indirect equals to eight to two, and spurious equals to eight to three, right? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to move at the real world at time t plus one, right? And the question is how do we how do we do this, right? So the first thing we do we ask whether the direct effect is considered to be discriminatory or not. Okay, so if the effect is not considered to be is if, if it's not considered to be fair, if it is discriminatory in the future time step, we want the direct effect of x on the y hat on the predictor to be equal to zero. Okay, so this means eliminating an effect that we don't like. If the effect is considered to be fair, the key point here we cannot have the effect as being arbitrary. What we need to do is we need to set the effect of x on y hat to be equal to what it was 
for the true outcome. So in some sense, we don't want to amplify along pathways that are, that are not considered discriminatory. We don't want to amplify differences between groups, right? And then what we want to do is we want to do the same, the same analogous reasoning for indirect and spurious effects. So what this does, this is this is a sort of a cute looking slide, but this is a formal algorithm that has like hypothesis testing under the hood, right? And it tells us how to move from the real world of time t to the real world of time t plus one, right? In a in a in a meaningful in a meaningful way. And this is our equity principle for for the task of for the task of, of fair prediction. Okay, and I will I will now give you an idea. I will talk about about task three, fair decision making. So as I said, there's in this setting there's a specific decision variable d that precedes the outcome of interest. Okay, so we're now moving to the last part of the the very end of the talk is importantly the discretion of the decision maker. Right, the decision is what the clinician. This is where the clinician is, is, is involved, right? What we're doing is what we're trying to do is we're trying to optimize the outcome. So the expected value of Y sub D. So what that means is we're trying to optimize the health of the population or something like that. And we may be subject to some kind of a budget constraint, right? So for example, we may not be able to treat everyone with, or we may not be able to give everyone a transplant or, or something. Right? So we mentioned already examples. So giving respiration, sorry, improving respiration by giving ventilators, improving survival by giving surgery and transplant. These are the these are the types of things that we types of questions that we have in mind. So now the key question is how do we conceptualize how do we conceptualize fairness in these instances, right? How do we how do we conceptualize in, uh, fairness in these decision making settings? And I'm going to talk about this in a specific example, which I've looked at a lot and is a super interesting one is about the, the question of allocating respirators in intensive care or dementia. So what you will observe are a longer range of uh, along a number of data sets that on average men are more likely to be given a respirator than women. Okay. And we're now trying to get to the bottom of, of why this is the case. So what we do first is we just use the we use the graphical model, right? The set of means okay. is just illness severity, sex is the is is the protected attribute. Agent comorbidity is a clear ventilator is, is our control of interest, and we're trying to optimize the respiratory stability of the patient, right? So the way that the decision making works in settings like this, we are trying to, we are often basing our decision on the so-called conditional average treatment effect of the decision onto the outcome. Okay. So what we're doing is we're comparing two settings. We're comparing the setting in which the patient is given a ventilator. And we look at their respiration versus the setting in which they're not given a respirator, right? And then we look at the difference between these two potential outcomes, conditional on all the available information, and those that are worth treating are those with the highest level of the so-called benefit or the conditional average treatment effect, right? So if someone has a high increase in survival or a high improvement in respiratory function associated with being given a, a respirator, these are the people that are that are the most likely the ones to, that need to be treated, right? So this is the guiding quantity. So this is a well-known result in, in, in the in, in statistical in statistical decision theory and reinforcement learning. This is not something novel, not yet at least. Okay. So what is important is there's a first key equity principle that comes in a setting like this. And the equity principle says the following. So the probability of being given the decision at the fixed level of the benefit should be the same for men as it is for women. So what that means is that, for example, you have two people, both of whom have a 20% increase in survival associated with being given a surgery, you should be, and you can only allocate treatment to one of them, you should be agnostic whether you pick a male or a female. So this is encoding some kind of an equity principle that is quite important, right? At the same level, equal treatment at the same level of benefit from treatment. This is this is the this is the principle. What is also important and is a very interesting question that comes next is what if the benefit itself differs between groups? What if men have a higher benefit on average, right? This is also a setting that we that is a very interesting one, right? And the question is, what we do, sorry, the solution to, to, to this setting is the benefit itself can be added as a node to the to the causal diagram. Okay. And what this allows us to do, it allows us to perform the causal explanation using the same method that we had before, but on the benefit itself, right? So the difference in the benefit can be can be explained by direct effect which means that women may have a lower biological benefit from, from mechanical ventilation. It's a possibility. It's not true in the data, but it's a possibility. Could be the indirect effects, so or maybe women are less, less sick in this data, and then they, they require less mechanical ventilation. Uh, and then it could be 
the case that women and us who are younger on average, right? This could also be another explanation. And what is beautiful is that we are using exactly the same tools as we had before, but we're doing something very different. We're now decomposing the benefit. We're no longer decomposing the difference in the, in the allocation of treatment or the outcome. We're decomposing something different. And this is, I think, a major, major uh, conceptual step in the right direction. Uh, now, the question is, of course, now that I, I've told you about this, the question for you will ask me is which of these effects are in reality the ones that are key, right? Is it the equity principle of equal treatment at an equal level of benefit, or is it the direct and direct and spurious effects that drive this? So what we do to analyze this, we go into the mimic four data again, and what we do is we group patients by the, by the benefits deciles. So it means that in every decile, people are roughly equally sick, right? And what we do on the y-axis, we call the probability of being given mechanical ventilation, right? And what you observe is that in every decile of this population, men are more likely to be treated than women. So what that means is that at equal benefit rates, uh, uh, men are more likely to be treated. So our principle of equal, equal treatment at equal benefit is violated in this, in this data, seemingly, okay? So this is, the, this, is the, this is the American data. And of course, the clinician then comes and says, is this a robust finding? Does this replicate across, across different data sets? And then what, what, is, what is very nice is we can go to the Dutch data. We can go to Amsterdam, the Amsterdam, the Amsterdam database on, on ICU on, that has a lot of ICU data, and we can look at the same problem, right, and ask the question there. And what you get is you get exactly the same pattern appearing in a different on a different continent now, right? So what this is signaling is that with this causal type of analysis, we are capturing in, we are capturing some epidemiologically robust phenomena. It's not these are not sort of uh, cherry picked examples or, or something as a coincidence. These are robust epidemiologic phenomena, and hopefully the 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 these examples uh, illustrate that in a good way. So this is my last slide. I have 20 seconds left. I will take 30 seconds, I think, to just summarize uh, what is what has been what has been said in the in the talk today. So these are the three tasks of biodetection, fair prediction, and fair decision making. And I, I just want to remind you what are the key principles, what are the key takeaways from the from the talk today and moving forward. The first principle in biodetection is that we want to decompose the TV measure, the marginal disparity. We want to decompose it into direct, indirect, and spurious parts. That's the first key realization. The second key realization is that non-zero effects may imply inequity. They don't, not, they don't necessarily imply inequity, but may. So they need to be investigated further. In the context of fair prediction, we saw that the TV being equal to zero does not imply that direct and direct and spurious effects are equal to zero. So we cannot just minimize the TV. But instead, what we do is we know that the causal effect of the protected attribute on the predictor should equal the causal effect of the protected attribute on the true outcome if a pathway is considered to be fair, whereas if the path, a pathway is considered to be unfair, we want to remove this effect and set this causal effect to zero, right? So this second part allows us to move to, uh, to the future world to construct their prediction, predictors. And finally, in the task three, we say that equal treatment at fixed levels of, of benefit is required. This is what we call benefit fairness usually. And finally, we also know that decomposing the benefit itself into direct and direct and spurious parts tells us a lot about, uh, about the underlying system. And this is uh, sort of a summary of everything that was covered today. Uh, I'm done, there's just a list of publications. Uh, thank you for the time. And I'm happy to take any questions here or offline or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you, Dago. Um, I have a thinking take a couple of things. It's exactly the top. So, mm -hmm. um, first, at the end of task two, yes, you have was the spurious effect fair or not? Why are we asking if the spurious effect is like? Why do I care about the spurious effect anymore? Like, uh -huh. what does it mean for it to be fair or unfair? Since it's spurious, it's not a real phenomenon. Well, you, I, it's sort of interesting, but I'll, let me give you a spurious effect that you may care about. It goes outside medicine. I will come up with a medical one. But think about redlining. Redlining is a very well-known phenomenon in, in, in economics, right, in which you have people of, of certain racial groups living in, in, in the same zip code, and they were born into this place possibly, right? And they, they, it's not, there's no causal effect of, of, of race on the location of living for, for many people, right? What you observe is that instead of, using the, instead of using the race, what banks have done historically, they have discriminated against these groups based on the location of living. So in some sense, this is a spurious effect in which there's huge reason for being concerned, right? The bank is sort of harming a group based on a proxy for that group. So in some sense, spurious effects, even though 
at the face of it, they don't seem super important, you still want to think about them. And here in the in the uh, medical one as well, right? Age is correlated correlated with uh, with sex, right? Or sorry, race is correlated with age of admission in ICU medicine, right? And really, what what is happening? What we know is that going backwards, we know that this is like a difference in chronic health, and we know there's a public health crisis on its own, right? That we are aware of. And what what is important for us that if if we have populations coming in that are different, we may be propagating this, and we want to think about how we're propagating it, and in which ways, and how to how to quantify this. So that's good, but it means I'd want to subdivide sporous effects into permissible and impermissible yeah, yeah. types. So I agree, we need I, a mechanism for separating. Absolutely, absolutely. This is why we have 12 hours of lectures on this, because this is exactly what you want to do next. Yes, please. Uh, so I was wondering about, so in example two, you gave the example of um, the Hamilton depression. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes. And so there's the idea is that if you want to predict mm -hmm. the depression score, you yes. want to predict it in a more fair manner that... Yes. Then what the label might be because we think that there is there could be a bias, bias possibly is that can do. Um, but then how do we kind of get at and I guess maybe this is outside of the scope of mm -hmm. the causal framework but is there a way to get at the truth kind of beyond what the label is because yes. ideally we want to predict the, whether this person is depressed I but, understand I yeah. understand a very hard question I think a very hard question because what I what we have what we have sketched is how to get a predictor that removes some of the effects, for example, direct effect. You don't want to base your depression scale directly on, on someone's sex or gender, right? This is undesirable. But how well this corresponds to the true underlying uh, notion about how, how ill this person is, is actually a slightly separate question. It's a great one. And I, on, the honest answer, I think, for now is I don't know how to, how to do this one. But if I did, I would probably... People in the in the in mental health would be very interested in this, right? This I think undermined a lot of the time. So I think it's a great question. Yeah. Yes. For the task two, it, yes. it was like you were looking at the relative decomposition of both the actual data and then the prediction. Exactly. And you want to impose constraints on yes. the effects. Yes. Um, these are like complex and very arbitrarily functional, depending on. We have an implementation. It's not so hard, actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But you like, can do you can do all kinds of th different things because if you think about about NDE and NN is operators on functions. Yeah. These are actually linear operators on functions. So if you want to do if you want to do boosting. Yeah. You can do you can do all kinds boosting of boosting. Well. You can do neural implementations. We have implementations of it. So it's not it's not so it's not so wild. It's not, it's, yeah. It's, it's doable. It's tractable, and we have done it actually. Yes. There's a couple of questions on this. Okay, that's what I was ah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah, please. Kung, Kung, do you want to speak up first? Uh, sure. So great, great talk. Thank you. And I, I guess my two questions, they are related to each other. So I, I guess you have to pre, or basically this is a hypothesis driven model, right? You have to know what exactly Z is and what exactly W is in terms of the variables, yes. right? In yes. Order, okay. In order to make a decision whether this SC or IE or you know D is fair or not. Yes. All right. So, but but a lot of time we just don't know what is the so what is the source of this kind of discrimination. How can we do this? You know, in this in case like uh, we have a bunch of data, you know, which can be many many variables, but we just don't know which one is the source. Oh, oh, yes. So it's some kind of, you're you're adding some kind of a variable selection problem on this, right? If right, I'm... I like this because you know yeah. essentially. Yeah, we have some assumptions, right? Say, you know, um, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. That. I can give you, I can give you the answer. This is not actually not such a problematic thing because what what we do, the way we do the estimation here, we're using under the hood. There are different statistic ways of doing this, but what is important is that the set Z and the set W, these things can be possibly high dimensional. Of course, if you blow up the dimension to hundreds of thousands, things become very hard. But if the signal is sparse and under the hood, we're using like three ensembles for for estimation, and there's only a subset of the features that 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 are that are the important ones, we are in principle under the hood doing some kind of uh, variable selection as well. So this part is 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 not crazy hard to. To, to handle in the sense you want to put put all the variables in. Of course, if it becomes super hard, then it's, it becomes statistically impossible, right, to, to solve the problem in some sense. But Kong, Kong is saying you need to know which one belongs to which group, not just if you have too many, how to pick the ones that are made. Uh, you have to know which one is what. Yeah. W or C. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is absolutely. Like so right? the, the, this is domain exactly. This is this part is up to domain knowledge, right? We need to we need to have like domain experts that are understanding for different applications. 
which variables are causally influenced by the protected attribute, which ones are spurious correlates and so on. So this, this is a great point. So I think this is, this is, as I said, right, we are placing some kind of assumption. We would ideally want to have the structural causal model. We can never get this. We're using the causal diagram instead, right? And we're placing some assumption in terms of what goes into Z and W. And importantly, uh, wh why I think this is sort of a middle point is that causal, you don't have to specify a lot. This is a cluster causal diagram. There's a person here in this, in this, in, in the department who is, has done great work on this. So what that means is that you can put variables into a group. So you don't have to specify any relations within the set of meters or within the set of confounders, right? You can specify fewer assumptions and that makes it more practical. But I do acknowledge you need to, you need to, you need to cluster Z and W in some sense. I hope that that answers the question. I think we need to stop now. We're pretty far okay. over in minutes. Uh, yes. We can email the last question. The real words, uh, okay. Are the benefit... or you can read it right now, but let us stop here. And yes, say thank you. yes. Thank you. <laughs>